Okay, so to start, um, we're going to start talking about a fun word, this idea of a tragedy. Um, and when we think of tragedy today, you generally think of like a sad story. Um, Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy. Everybody dies in the end. It's a very sad story. Um, but at kind of a literary level, the term tragedy means something more than just a sad story. Um, it comes from the Greek word tragoidia, which was an official Greek term from like Greek artists and, and authors and playwrights back um, like thousands of years ago. And the whole purpose of a tragedy wasn't just a sad story. Tragedies are not that. Um, that's not what makes something a tragedy. What makes something a tragedy, according to um, um, English schol like scholars of literature, is that it, it's not unhappiness. It's the solemnity of the remorseless working of things. And so the whole point of tragedies, when you look at uh, Shakespearean tragedies or Greek tragedies even, like the story of Oedipus, it's a sad story, but it's like a weird story too. This guy um, like kills his, or kills his dad, falls in love with his mom, pokes his eyes out. It's really bizarre. Um, it's not necessarily sad. It's just kind of, you look at it and you're like, ew. But as you're looking at it, you also see that it is inevitable. And that is the point of a tragedy, that the deliberate choices of humans set off inevitable and inescapable chains of events. That's what makes something a tragedy. So Romeo and Juliet is a sad story, sure, but it is also inevitable. And we can see that as an audience. We see when Romeo gives Juliet the poison and says, drink this if I don't come on time or whatever. Um, we know as an audience, like, oh no, that's setting off a chain of events where she's definitely going to drink it and she's going to die. And then he's probably going to die. And you can see like downstream as you're looking at it as an audience member, you know things are going to end up poorly. And then the allure of a tragedy is basically watching a train wreck. You know that it's going to happen. You know it's going to be messy and you can't do anything about it. And that's what makes something a tragedy more than just a sad story. It's this inevitability. Um, and this is important because it, it comes back to this idea of, of, of an economic term, this idea of a common pool resource. Um, and these things essentially generate tragedies that are inevitable and unable, you can't escape them. Um, so a common pool resource is something that is non-excludable, which means you can't stop people from using it, but it is rival, which means as people use it, it starts getting depleted and goes away. You consuming a, com a piece of a common pool resource means that other people cannot, but it is non-excludable. Nobody can stop you from using it. And so these two characteristics here create a sort of tragedy. Um, so one of the most common prints, like the, the common examples of this that you see in all sorts of textbooks is this idea of the commons. And we talked about this a couple sessions ago. The commons was this invention um, in England and then imported to New England of just having common pasture for animals to graze on. Anybody can use it. Um, but the tragedy part of this, um, what makes the commons a tragic thing in economics is it has this inevitable quality to it where if you look out your window and you're a farmer and you see that the the commons out in the, the town square is under capacity, you're going to go send out more animals to, to start grazing on it. And all of your neighbors are going to start sending their animals to go graze on it. And that's fine in the early days of the, of, of, of using the, um, using the field, um, adding an additional cow, like the, the marginal cow, the damage you get from a marginal cow doesn't do much. Um, but as the commons gets more and more full, as people keep adding more and more animals, because it's perfectly rational to do so, then eventually the commons will go over capacity and there will be no more grass and it will die. And that is the tragedy. And so the tragedy here is we see this system where we know that this is inevitable. There's public grounds out there. People are going to start using it, which means they're going to start overusing it, which will cause depletion, which will cause destruction. And there's nothing we can do to escape that. Um, the guy who invented this term, tragedy of the commons, was this guy named Garrett Hardin. Um, you read a little bit about him in some of your readings for today. Um, and his conclusion is that this is the tragedy, that every man is locked into a system that compels him to increase his herd without limit, but the world is limited. And so um, everybody destroys everybody else in their own self-interest. And his main conclusion is that freedom in a commons brings ruin to all. And he was very dramatic about this. Um, and 
it, it's a it's a helpful principle and like it, it does happen you see overfishing you see overforesting you see all sorts of situations where there are commons issues um, but Hardin himself was a white supremacist and eugenicist and um, was applying these principles of a tragedy of the commons to like global population um, he applied this principle to to population growth um, he was anti having kids um, and he was actually anti the, the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights um, that was issued in, in the 1940s, right after the creation of the, of the United Nations. He was very against that because his whole idea was that promoting human rights would then promote population growth, which would then promote tragedy of the commons and destruction of the world. So he was anti-human rights, anti-civil rights in the interest of, of not overpopulating the earth. So not the greatest um, ideas here. Um, and so that's all we're really going to talk about Hardin because he kind of invented this phrase, tragedy of the commons, but there are better ways of, of thinking about it, um, as we'll see later today. So there's a whole host of examples of common pool resource problems. Um, none of you are cow farmers. None of you look out the window and put your cows on a pasture. And so it's like, it's a very common textbook example, but um, it's not like readily graspable because none of us have cows. Um, but there's a whole host of other issues, um, other examples of things that are non-excludable but are rivalrous. So fisheries, for instance. Um, fishing stocks throughout the world have been declining over the past few decades because they are non-excludable. You can't build like a fence out in the ocean to claim your region of fish um, because fish just go wherever. Um, but it's rival. If you take out uh, 6,000 tons of fish, nobody else can pick up those fish. And so eventually it will lead to the, the natural depletion of those resources. And we see that with global fish stocks. Forests, we see the same thing. We see overforestation and deforestation um, because, again, they're non-excludable, but they're rivalrous. Um, pastures, that's the cow example. We see lots of that. Um, one of the most common applications of this idea of, of common pool resources is the air, especially with pollution, um, where it, you can't exclude people from putting stuff in the air. You can't stop factories from just polluting because the air is a public good. It's out to everybody. Um, but it is rivalrous. Um, if too many people put, if too many factories put pollutants in the air, it reduces our ability to breathe that air um, and reduces quality for everybody. And so as a result, you get this tragic march towards too much pollution, too much carbon in the atmosphere, and then you have climate change. Um, beyond these larger environmental issues, you also have more practical common pool resource issues. Um, antibiotic resistance is actually a huge common pool resource problem, um, where if you go to the doctor for like a cold or for pneumonia or for some sort of infection, um, they'll most likely um, prescribe you some sort of antibiotics, which at an individual level is fine. You can consume those antibiotics and it'll make you better and that's great. Um, and so that's fine for you. But at a structural level, if every doctor is over prescribing the use of antibiotics, it eventually creates antibiotic resistant bacteria and new antibiotics have to be discovered and invented that work on these resistant strains of bacteria. Um, and so what you have, this whole idea of antibiotic resistance is a tragedy of the commons. You can't exclude people from using um, antibiotics. Um, because like doctors have access to the stuff, they can prescribe whatever they want, and so that's non-excludable. But at a large scale, it is rival. Um, the more antibiotics, you, antibiotics are prescribed, the more likely it is that resistance will grow, um, which then reduces the ability for future people to use those same, those same antibiotics to treat their infections. And so you get this, this tragedy, this slow-moving tragedy towards um, antibiotic resistance. Beautiful views, um, like of a canyon or of a mountain or of a beach or something, this is the same thing. Um, adding one additional person to look at like um, a cool beach sunset is fine. And then so more people will start coming and more people will start coming. You can't exclude them. But eventually it will scale up to something where the beach is finally inaccessible and it's way too crowded. And that was the inevitable consequence of just having a pretty view from a beach. Um, because everybody shows up, that's the rational thing to do, and then it gets overused and the view is spoiled. 
Um, fruit in public parks is also a really fascinating instance of this. Um, if you've ever been to like a fancier public park where they have like lemon trees or orange trees or cherry trees, um, often the cherries that exist are very underripe um, and people will pick them when they are underripe. Um, I actually did this um, I, uh, when we lived in Egypt. Uh, we took this quick vacation over to Spain and Seville has like orange trees all over the city and there's these decorative oranges, but they looked good. Um, and so we picked them and tried to eat one and it was disgusting um, because it was too early to eat them and it was not a strain that was edible, but like um, still our incentive was to take it before other people did. And that's the same thing that happens with general public fruit um, that exists in the world. You're going to pick it too early. Um, so it is a little bit okay. So it's, it, it tastes fine. But if you wait too long to pick it, wait until it's perfectly ripe, other people will get it first. And so your incentive is to pick it early, um, which then means it turns into kind of a game theory situation where if, if your incentive is to pick it maybe a day before it's ripe, um, then somebody else is going to pick it two days before it's ripe to beat you. And then somebody else is going to pick it three days before it's ripe to beat them. And so you end up with like everybody picking the gross non-ripe fruit so they can stop people from getting the ripe fruit, um, which is a common pool resource problem. It's non-excludable. You can't stop people from picking the fruit, um, but it's rivalrous. If somebody takes it, then nobody else can take it. And so what you get is this weird incentive structure um, to purposely get the early fruit, even though it's not great. Um, road capacity, this is similar to beautiful views. Adding one additional car to a freeway is fine. Um, it's not going to take up somebody else's spot at a small scale, but at a large scale, you add way too many cars to a freeway and you'll end up with gridlock traffic. Um, and so most public goods issues that we've been talking about, um, a couple of sessions ago, we talked about public goods and how there are very, very few pure public goods. Um, sunlight is one, um, because like it's non-rivalrous me looking at or me benefiting from the sun does not take away sun rays from other people um, and it's non-excludable I can't stop people from using the sun um, but anything else that we think of as um, a public good like firefighting services or freeways or things like that it feels like a public good we don't want to exclude people from them um, but once you start scaling that up, it becomes rivalrous. There's only so many fire trucks that can go out and put out fires. Um, roads only have a certain amount of capacity on them. And so eventually you're going to run into an overuse of, of these public goods, which then turns it into a common pool resource. Um, a final example of this is this idea of Christmas creep, which is similar to the fruit in public parks example here, where if you've noticed over the past few years, um, Christmas music has appeared on radio stations and in grocery stores um, earlier and earlier every year. Um, where when I was growing up, it would like December 1st was the day when Christmas music would start showing up. And then it started appearing mid November, early November. Um, last year, I was in Kroger at the end of October um, before Halloween, and I heard Christmas music going. Um, it's becoming earlier and earlier. And it's because it's a common pool resource problem. You can't stop stores from doing it, um, but it is essentially rival. Like you want to, like if you want to promote your Christmas sales because that's the highest sale, that's the highest quarter of sales in the United States. Um, that's when most people buy stuff. You want people to get into the Christmas spirit to so buy stuff, and so you want to play that Christmas music to get them thinking about Christmas. And so the natural. Um, tendency, the natural incentive here is to move it earlier and earlier, and then your competitors will also move it earlier and earlier um, because you're essentially polluting the world with too much Christmas music, um, too much early Christmas music, um, and it causes a common pool resource problem, and it causes an overproduction of Christmas music in the world. Um, so how do we fix these things? Um, they are problems, especially the environmental side with pollution um, and climate change. So there are general approaches to fixing these things that we'll talk about here. You can fix common pool resource issues with privatization. You can fix it with the government. Or as an alternative to both of those systems, you can use informal institutions and self-regulation to fix these public goods issues and to fix the, the collective action problem and the game theory problems that you have with an overuse of a commons. And with these solutions, you can actually avoid the tragedy, um, this inevitable collapse of society um, by relying on one of these institutional fixes.